Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to see many names of people that I haven't seen from a while, from a while and I, I'm glad we have a chance to get together virtually. Um, you know, I was talking with Carol Hilmer a little bit earlier in the day, and we were reflecting on how we're coming up on almost a year of working remotely, a little bit shy of that. We've got another five or six weeks, but she said in in Cal's HR yesterday, uh, everybody was uh, feeling like they were having a, um, uh, a Groundhog Day experience, just like the movie. Um, and I, you know, had a chuckle about that, uh, but it's certainly true. So I want to thank everyone for the resilience and hard work uh, and persistence above all that that uh, you've all been exhibiting um, over the last year, and and we keep drawing on a, a great well of, of strength. So I, I appreciate that. Now, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are pretty familiar with Zoom by now. I can tell that, that because um, I see everybody's got their mics muted. Um, so if, if you by chance don't, um, please make sure to mute your mic uh, until you ask a question um, so that we can minimize background noise. Um, we're recording the meeting for people who aren't able to make it to the live meeting, uh, so it'll be available later. And um, I want to ask you to please save your questions until we prompt you. Um, I think we'll have plenty of time for Q and A, uh, but uh, so we'll we'll save the the questions until the end. And um, when we get to that point, um, since we have now uh, quite a big number, we've got almost a hundred people. I think it would be best to uh, raise your hand uh, virtually or put a note in the chat and uh, Nikki is going to help monitor that so we can call on people who have their have questions. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, we can get uh, on with the presentation. Um, here we go. Great. Um, so uh, lovely summer day there. We can look forward to that soon. Um, one of the topics I wanted to start with uh, is about the special COVID uh, protocols that we have this spring. Uh, these have changed since last semester. Um, and I wanted to review these, especially since some of you may not be uh, coming to campus frequently, so might not have tuned in. Um, there are new protocols in place for testing and for visiting campus. Uh, anytime you come to campus, you will need to have tested negative uh, for the virus um, within the previous eight days. And uh, this is going to be needed for building access. And uh, the active enforcement of that requirement um, is now going to be starting on February 10th. We just had an update from the chancellor about that. Uh, today. Um, so before you come to campus for the first time uh, this spring, it's important to plan ahead to make sure that you have a negative test within the time period. Um, and this is true for all of our uh, employees, including graduate and professional students uh, and postdocs, other trainees. There are about 14 sites around campus that will offer the free testing that's required. Um, and there are several that are really convenient for, for us uh, in our part of campus, including at Camp Randall in the, the Shell, uh, the Carson Gully uh, Center, Dijop Residence Hall and Union South are the closest. And I also would advocate for uh, the Nielsen uh, tennis uh, facility. It's got great parking and, and uh, short waiting time. So there's a free app uh, called Safer Badgers, and I'm going to try to get mine up here. Um, and you you need to download this if you're going to be tested on campus and coming to campus. Uh, it will help you find the, these testing locations and obtain your test results. Uh, and something that is new is that they have um, uh, an indicator of waiting time, so green, yellow, and red. Um, I've tested now three times, including uh, yesterday and find that when it's when the indicator is green, there really is a short waiting time and that works really well. So um, you will have to show proof of a negative test with the app. 
Uh, and um, the one way that you can do that is through the app. And here, this shows my, my, um, my badge. This is called a Badger badge. And you can see there the green dot, which indicates that I've had a recent negative test. Um, and I'm also told that you can um, you know, have a, a printout that shows the same thing. Um, so our buildings, many of our buildings are going to be um, actively monitored and they are classified differently depending on how many in-person classes they are having uh, and the amount of in-person activity that's anticipated there. So you will find some um, uh, personnel, uh, some Badger ambassadors that will ask you uh, to show your badge uh, as you come into the buildings. They won't be monitored all the time, but sort of spot checking. Um, just a couple more reminders before we leave this slide. So we still have the same travel guidelines in place that we had last semester, which means that university sponsored travel outside of Wisconsin or by air within the state uh, is not uh, available. Uh, that is uh, not allowed. Uh, and within the state, uh, Cal's faculty and staff are expected to continue to observe um, college and uh, university policies there. And as, uh, as there's a need uh, to make changes to that, we will, we will keep you updated about changing policies. Um, I guess in short, we wanna encourage uh, those who um, can do their work remotely to continue to do that. And the same thing with events. Uh, by now, many of us have probably participated in many virtual events. And until we have a, a stronger um, public health situation and until the state and the county change their policies, we wanna do as much as we can remotely, especially with large groups. Um, so the next topic that I wanted to uh, cover with you is where we are with, uh, with our budget. Uh, I know that you probably all have been hearing about uh, the financial impact of, of the virus uh, and how we are coping with that. So um, last fall, uh, Chancellor Blank had an article um, that she authored uh, that uh, estimated uh, the financial impact of the pandemic over a 15 month period to be about $320 million. Uh, and this is due to uh, both increased costs that we've had, as well as lower uh, revenue, some lost revenue of various sorts. And um, this, not all of these costs are being pushed to the academic units, to schools and colleges. Um, only a, a certain portion are. Uh, but they're, they're, this has come in a couple of different flavors and I wanna cover all of this briefly so that you have that background. So we've had uh, both with our 101 funding, which is our core uh, general program revenue that we use, uh, we've had a one-time cut or a lapse from the current fiscal year, and that has totaled a little over 2 million. And now for uh, next fiscal year, we will have a base budget cut, which will be recurring therefore, of a little over 2.7 million. Now, 104 is another type of state uh, support that is especially for our extension mission. And it comes to us from the division of extension. We also had a one-time cut uh, in 104, um, which uh, covered, was uh, taken out of um, two fiscal years uh, budget, the current one and the previous one. And that's totaled about 450,000. And we are now uh, modeling a base budget cut of uh, 275,000, a little bit more than that, uh, which is about the same proportion on our 104 funds uh, as our 101 cut is. Um, so I'm going to take this apart a little bit for you, uh, starting with a 101 one-time budget cut. Um, and also want to mention if these pie charts look familiar to you, it's because uh, we, they have already been in an ECALS article uh, from uh, 
at the end of, of last calendar year. And in the chat, Cara is going to post a link to that article if you want to see more. So as I said, the total uh, one-time cut to CALS uh, for our 101 funds um, for the current fiscal year is about $2 million. And we have already allocated that um, to um, all of our various units. Um, what we see here with the pie chart at the top shows um, how our 101 funds are distributed among departments, centers, and a, a, a lot of other things that we've aggregated here together, including CALS admin services and support, uh, ag research stations and the dairy innovation hub. Uh, and with the one-time cut, uh, because we had been accumulating some uh, salary savings from empty positions and a few other types of savings in anticipation of a cut, uh, we were able to absorb a lot more of that cut centrally and uh, therefore uh, um, pass less of that on to uh, departments. Um, yeah, the bottom shows, the, I think I said this backwards, the bottom shows uh, our 101 funds, the top shows how we distributed the cuts. So even though departments have 74% of our funding, departments and centers together are 75%, they only had half of the cut. So um, moving on then to uh, the base cut, which is more of a, a contemporary story. Um, at the tail end of January, uh, CALS had sent, has sent letters to um, our center directors and our department chairs about their cuts uh, and, and what we uh, asked them to uh, find uh, to be able to give back. By the way, these cuts need to be from salary savings because we have to give back the uh, FTEs uh, so that the campus also recaptures the fringe costs there. Um, we see here in looking at, the, at our uh, 101 budget, um, again, at the top, um, we've got one more category here uh, that we didn't consider in our one-time cut. Um, and that is the very light gray uh, which is labeled farm research operations support. This is especially uh, support that we have uh, to defer the cost of fringes for uh, personnel who do uh, research on our, uh, on our uh, agricultural research stations and, and farms uh, and uh, that are paid off of other revenues, but it, it covers the cost of their fringes. And you can see that's 11% of our budget. Uh, but if you look at the base budget cut, uh, we've taken more money out of that. Um, the reason is that we have found that um, historically we've used those funds for more than their intended purpose, subsidizing some fee for service operations. And so we were able to take uh, more, more cut out to, to refocus the way we use them and to therefore save the rest of our operations uh, um, or many of our operations uh, some additional costs. So um, this has helped to protect academic departments um, in particular. We've reduced 101 funding to some special purpose programs including the Madison Initiative for Undergraduates Historical uh, Allocations and the Dairy Innovation Hub in direct proportion to their fraction of the CALS budget. Um, and um, once again, departments here are 66% of our total budget, uh, but have received 56% uh, of the total reduction. Um, I just want to mention also about agricultural research stations, which in some past budget cuts have taken a disproportional reduction. Uh, they this time are not being disproportionately cut, but are receiving a, uh, a more proportional cut. Um, so in, 
thinking about how to cope with these the fiscal challenges as a result of the cut, we're encouraging our units to think about multiple strategies, which might include discontinuing or downsizing some activities that they deem to be of lower priority, or they can transfer the costs from 101 uh, funded activities to other sources of revenue. Um, so we hope that, that units will be looking at uh, a full spectrum of strategies. And this was also covered in an ECALS post uh, January 25th, and uh, Cara is putting that link in the chat as well. A um, little bit about 104 budget cuts. Um, we uh, have been very uh, carefully marshalling our, our funds here. We've had a number of uh, vacancies, uh, which we froze and uh, already last year. And we've had some additional vacancies that uh, have accumulated and are still uh, occurring during the spring. Um, and so we've been very careful and had a freeze on, on um, covering any of those uh, until we figured out how, what our budget cuts would be in 104 and how we would cover it. With the one-time cuts, uh, which I told you totaled uh, 450,000, we were able to cover that uh, centrally uh, in CALS with some of these vacant positions and the salary savings we had, and we did not pass any of that on to any of our units. And um, now that we know uh, what our base cut will be, which we've just learned in the last couple of weeks, um, we are working to clear up some final details about uh, anticipated salary increases and some related issues. Uh, we'll be able to figure out um, exactly what activities we will uh, uh, cut versus um, be able to refund. So we have, we believe, more vacancies than we need to cover the cuts. Uh, and so once we clarify our numbers, we hope to be able to move forward with a small number of uh, the positions um, that we have planned. Um, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to do that yet this year. Okay. I'm sure there are lots of other questions about uh, budget and um, we'll be uh, eager to answer those as best we can uh, when we get to the question section. But I wanted to shift gears here and to talk about some diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. Um, and uh, some things that I'm, I'm really excited about uh, that we are working on. So um, let's start with some uh, requests or recommendations which came to us last fiscal year uh, from our very active uh, CALS Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Uh, they came to us over the spring and early summer with five recommendations, um, which uh, we have here. And actually, uh, we, have, uh, we had an eCALS article about this in the fall also. Cara, I don't know if you, you don't have that ready to go, but um, uh, perhaps we can still post it. I'll, I'll um, grab it and put it in the Okay, chat. thanks. Um, so uh, the ECALS article details not only the recommendations, but uh, my response as Dean about how we'd like to handle these. So we can spend a little bit of time on this. The first one is to establish best practices in hiring faculty and college leaders to enhance uh, a practice of equitable searches and screen processes. And um, the idea is we get this in place and then let's also look at how we are handling um, our, our, our staff searches as well. Uh, and I'm happy to say that this is already accomplished. So we had a, a lot of good collaboration between the EDC and our CALS HR, or the associate deans and back and forth. And so now we have recommendations for what best practices would be uh, and uh, or are and a checklist to help uh, groups that are doing searches 
to make sure that they have um, uh, equitable searches and eliminate biases in the searching practices. The next one uh, was that they asked us to develop a, a, a statement for CALS uh, about um, our value for anti-racist practices uh, and to, to be able to put that into position vacancy listings or PVLs and uh, other communications. And um, I, I support this strongly. We have an effort underway to, to draft. We have already some options available and we will have a consultative process to get feedback on the various options uh, that uh, we can use and, and come to a consensus about what, what we have for an anti-racism statement in the college. Um, and this is, um, uh, I think, I don't see any reason we can't have this in place by the end of the semester. Um, the third topic is to, mand to mandate uh, uh, cultural competency training for all Kyle's faculty and staff. So best practices in diversity and inclusion, uh, anti-racist practices uh, and related uh, topics. Um, I also support this. And um, just yesterday, we had the first conversation about this in the uh, Academic Program Council, the APC for the college. Uh, really um, receptive reaction, I think, from, from that committee. Um, and uh, it seems like um, a real consensus developing about what we're looking for here. Um, and the way I look at it is uh, we have a number of kinds of training where we would think of it as a, a compliance requirement, uh, something you do that's uh, short to the point and you tick a box. I think what we're looking for here is something that is more enriching, more professional development um, and that um, we would expect that there would be a lot of different ways to satisfy the requirement um, depending on what's meaningful to the individual and their, their background and how much they have been um, uh, developing their own cultural competency uh, in these issues for a while. So uh, we'll be working with the APC uh, on, on um, um, elaborating on this and how to implement this uh, over the coming semester. The fourth one is a similar uh, requirement for, for graduate students. Uh, and we have uh, uh, initiated a conversation with the Dean of the Graduate School, Bill Karpus. Um, they actually, in the Graduate School, are partnering with the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Educational Ach Achievement to inventory what options are available and, and what capacity they have for graduate student training. So we want to be able to work closely with the Graduate School um, on implementing this one. And I think what's uh, the most exciting undertake, uh, undertaking is to establish an Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in CALS. Um, I believe this is really important to have a, a focused locale for that, uh, fo focused personnel and leadership there. Um, so we're developing plans for that uh, and um, uh, expect to be initiating a, a search for a Chief Diversity Officer for the college later this spring. Um, some other things that are uh, uh, coming along, but are in more in the discussion phase. Some of these are a little bit more solid than others, but um, I am still excited about all of them. And these are student-centered initiatives. Um, something that I think many people feel is very important is uh, creating tools and uh, understanding for our instructors to make sure that they have inclusive teaching practices. And we've been exploring options on campus and it uh, looks like we will probably uh, do this in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a pilot fashion first. Uh, and we'll have more news about that a little bit later this semester. Um, we are looking at our first year uh, experience um, and uh, thinking about how we can make sure that our students um, are successful in um, 
learning and eventually working in a multicultural environment um, and what that means in the disciplines that they are studying here in CALS. There is uh, campus-wide a new training for first-year students. Uh, some of our uh, uh, sibling schools and colleges are building additional activities into their uh, college-specific first-year programs um, and uh, something that I think is very important for us to give careful consideration for. Um, we had a listening session with uh, some of our students of color and some alumni of color and something that really struck me and has stayed with me since we've had the conversation is about how important um, uh, guidance and mentorship is for students that are coming to a, a primarily white institution and to find community and to, to be successful. And uh, it's, it's important to me to uh, figure out a way that we can create a really effective mentorship program for our underrepresented students. Uh, and we'll, we'll be putting uh, time into that. Um, and also uh, one of our graduate programs uh, that's centered in CALS has created a mentorship program for other graduate students um, that focuses on activities beyond just academics, but so important for creating a community uh, and helping students feel at home and learning how to, to find and utilize resources uh, to help them be successful in every aspect of their graduate uh, experience. So we have a lot of activities going on and this is not even a complete census, but uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, excited about, about this uh, and we'll be taking questions in a little bit. But what I want to do at this point is to turn this over to Mark uh, Rickenbach, our senior associate dean. And Mark is going to cover uh, several topics here. Uh, I think we've got about three more slides, and then it will be time for Q&A. So Mark. Thank you, Kate. And good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to update you on uh, three things. Um, the first deals with the research and professor, re research and teaching professor titles. Um, a little bit about the climate survey update and some ways that we can be engaged in the CALS community. And the slide I'm seeing right now says CALS 101 FY22 base budget. Okay. I don't know what happened. There. Perfect. Thanks. Um, as some of you uh, may recall or, or are aware, the university approved two new titles to both recognize excellence and attract talent. Um, these are the research professor title and the teaching professor title. These are academic staff titles um, and appointments, but they have some, they operate in kind of a novel space among our employment roles, at least in two ways, and, and has given us some work to do here in CALS for this spring. First, department executive committees and the dean play a key role in the evaluation and appointment. This is different from what we do with um, our um, other academic staff appointments. Second, the campus requires schools and colleges to follow a governance process um, to establish these. And so there's going to be an establishment at the college level of, of a governance process, and then departments who want to use these titles will have to develop their own kind of rules and processes. Um, so we are moving forward on the CALS governance process this semester with the expectation that these titles um, should be available with the start of the next academic year, if not a little sooner. On the slide are the members of the two working groups whose work and efforts I deeply appreciate in making this work for CALS. One of the reasons they've rolled some of this authority down to the schools and colleges is to really make these titles fit kind of the working environment that we live in. And um, along with the members, I, I particularly want to acknowledge Rick Lindroth, who's chairing the research um, title group, and Rick Amasino, who is chairing the teaching working group. So their processes as they move forward this semester will include consultation with CASI and APC and governance approval later this spring. One of the areas we see for some immediate opportunity for these titles is um, uh, would be with the research professor title for our federal USDA and USGS scientists who are embedded in our CALS departments who have usually have some type of zero dollar affiliation and, and we see this as an, an immediate opportunity to, to use these titles. But I'm sure they'll, we'll see more in the future for ways to use these. And I think for, 
Um, the other group would be some of our, our really excellent um, instructional staff in the college who have a lot of experience. Um, we, can, we can recognize that through the um, teaching professor title. If we can move to the next slide. Um, as many of you know, we've been working on the Cal's Climate Survey since um, we've actually been working on it for almost a year now. And that work started kind of last year, last academic year, where we were developing kind of the questionnaire and the questions we would use. At that point, we envisioned a pilot that would work with five or six departments. Then this COVID thing happened and really kind of scrambled us in terms of how we thought about this. And in thinking about when we would do this, we, we took the risk of doing the college-wide survey um, straight off in fall. And I wanna thank everyone who took the time to respond to that. We had a response rate well over 40%, which is really good for these types of workplace um, surveys. And you know, so the response window closed in November. And since then, um, we've been working with the Office of Strategic Consulting to um, analyze those data and start to put together some processes. So I wanted to provide a little bit of an update. And really the focus for this semester is to identify some action items, things that departments, um, centers and units can do to kind of work on the climate in their units and, and make sure we have um, the types of places we wanna work in. And for departments, this can and should flow into your five-year plans. Um, this is the goal four. This is an area that you can look at and say how, the, how this work informs what you're doing with goal four. And this can be things you're already working on. It may help you elevate certain aspects of the things that are already there um, as they relate to your climate and equity activities. Um, as we're starting to pull the data together, one of the things I wanted to give people a sense is what they should expect in kind of the, the types of data and analyses that we're going to provide. I want to first note, this is really about trying to take the temperature of what's going on in, in our units. And so units will get um, a report here in the next few weeks that will include summaries and comparisons to the overall college, like how do you stack up compared to the college average or, or the things we find going on there. There'll be a separate college-wide report that will have summaries by different employment categories. Um, and later this summer, we'll also hope to do some additional analysis, hopefully on the feedback we receive from all of you with some maybe finer grain resolution. One of the things I really wanna emphasize here and something we made kind of key in designing the questionnaire is the importance of confidentiality. One of the things we've stressed in all of this is ensuring that people who answer the survey, their, their identities are, are protected and we will not know who responded. To that end is, for example, I haven't seen the actual raw data from this. This is all being handled through the Office of Strategic Consulting and the UW Survey Center, and they're doing this analysis. And in some ways that's created some bumps as we kind of navigate that partnership and how we roll this out to the whole college. But I think it's really important to establish this trust that we're going to treat this information and, and your trust in us to protect the data that you provided. And I'll just give you an example of one of the things we're thinking about. Anyone who took the survey and anyone who's ever taken a survey probably knows that we, we collected demographic data about what's going on in the college. And one of the things we found with those data is that there are some um, demographic categories that were on the survey where the response rate was really, not the response rate, but the number of respondents was really, really small. And so we wanna be very careful in how we do that. And my plan is here in the next month or so is to visit with the equity and diversity committee to talk to them about what's the best way to handle this to, to respect the confidentiality and the privacy of our respondents while still trying to make the place, um, uh, the, the college kind of a good climate for everyone. So that's some of the discussion that goes on as some of the things we learn in the data. This is kind of a really brief update, but we're hoping to have a, an ECALS post out soon that's gonna provide some more detail about where we're headed. And, by, and we will continue to work with the Office of Strategic Consulting, and we really appreciate your engagement in those processes as we, as we continue to move this forward. I think I'm ready for the last slide. Thanks, Kate. So as Kate mentioned, um, these continue to be hard times. Um, despite the promise of a vaccine and growing sunlight each day, it is important for all of us to stay engaged and, and stay healthy. 
there are a lot of opportunities um, that are out there for you to be involved in things going on in CALS. And just let me share a few. There's, um, as many of you know, there's the Equity and Diversity Committee activities around the Lunch and Learn series. Those of you who have participated in these know they have, cover a range of topics um, of, of interest across the board. And, and I wanna say even in COVID, like I think participation has gone up because of our ability to connect this way. So that's a great opportunity. There's also a cultural responsive training workshop that's coming up on April 29th. There's another Cal's Coffee coming up in April, on April 9th. Um, as we know, we like to recognize the work that people do in the college. And one of the ways we do that is through the Cal's Awards ceremony, which will be held on May 5th. And I also wanna remind folks that we still always are looking for nominations for um, people for these various awards that we have in the college. Um, we have a lot of great people. If you wanna recognize someone, I would strongly encourage you to, to nominate someone. And Cara, Cara has already put the link to the call over there in the chat box. So whatever you're doing, I encourage you to look for other seminars and talks that are, are of interest to you. And note that um, even if you can't attend these in person or live, um, many like the Lunkage and Learn are recorded for later viewing. The other thing that is coming out is a new interactive eCALS feature. Um, and this is uh, something that started, I believe on January 25th. And every other week we will feature your favorite thing about your current workspace and or exciting updates about your work. There'll be a monthly quiz that will ask you to answer questions and find articles on specific topics that can be found in eCALS articles that will be posted earlier, that have been posted earlier that month. A winner will be selected and sent a CALS prize. And I'll be honest, I don't know what the prizes are. So it may be exciting to learn what those are. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Kate for any final remarks before we go to questions and discussion. Thanks. Well, um, I think that that just about does it. And I like the ending on that note. Um, I have asked the uh, CALS External Relations Communications Group, are they eligible to answer these questions? Because I know they know the most about the college. And uh, I, I think we have to have a conversation there. So um, let's go ahead and uh, have uh, your questions and answers. And Nikki's going to help me identify people. Um, so hands, you can put up your hands electronically or uh, put something in the chat if you like. You can direct message me if you want to do that. So far, I'm not seeing anything, Nikki, are you? Oh, here we have one from Christina Hamilton. Um, do we have the link to the cultural responsiveness training? I'm having trouble finding it. Um, this is the EDC thing that was mentioned in the slide. Um, Cara, can you help us out with that? Yes, I can um, look into that. Okay, and then we have a question. Will there be any anticipated cuts to positions in CALS? Um, so um, I don't know that I can e answer that um, with complete certainty uh, because um, we have given assignments for a dollar amount to uh, our units and they must make the decisions on how best to handle it within the units. Um, I know for the things that are, um, you know, in more central administration, uh, we have been carefully saving up some vacancies so that we have some way to um, uh, meet our cut and uh, reutilize the salary savings for some reinvestment. And I believe we're going to be able to do our central cuts without cutting any positions. So I know how much our uh, units appreciate their uh, employees um, and we'll have to see how it plays out in each local circumstance. 
And I think this question is from Mark. How do the new titles work with the TTC project? Gosh, I wish Carol was here. Um, but um, so these, um, they are, I'm actually going to say, is Carol here? Because I don't recall if she is. I don't know if she's busy because I don't know exactly how they fit. They have been factored into that process, but it's not exactly. And Carol is here to save me. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the titles are incorporated into the TTC SJDs, they will be the official titles as we move forward. So we will be able to use those, but we have to work through all of the pieces that the committees are working on right now before we will be able to utilize them. Meanwhile, Chris, uh, Cara found that link and put it in the chat. All yeah, right, and just an question. update, um, it's mentioned on that page that the link I put in there, but the details are not um, are not out there yet, but they will be in ECALS when we have them. All right, and then this is for Mark. Can Mark clarify the climate, climate survey data? In our small group meeting last week with Deb Gerke, they shared that the data would only be at the college level, no more segmented than that. However, Mark's slide referenced unit reports will include summaries and comparisons to overall college. So I think what we'll do is the, so there'll be a department wide report. So if um, a department gets data, they will get kind of the responses overall for um, each kind of the questions of interest that they're gonna share in those reports. So you'll know like, how did everyone in our department or center or unit respond to this question? And then there'll be the similar data for the overall CALS report. What we're not breaking down at the departmental level is anything by any employment role or any demographic numbers. And largely because even in our very largest departments, this, the groups just get too small given some of the promises we made on confidentiality. But at the college level, we will be able to break things down by different employment groups. And that can maybe help inform departments about kind of what they might expect in their own unit. All right, speaking of TTC, I know the timeline got pushed back to 2021. Do we know when the new titles SJDs have to be finalized this year? We do not officially know. We expect to be receiving information um, soon. The suggested timeline is by July 1, but that is not yet official. Um, I think campus will be coming out with information very, very soon in that regard. That's all the questions I have right now. So since the, the questions are kind of few in number, if you do have one and just want to unmute your mic and ask it, um, you can do that too. Well, we'll give you another minute to think. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say that uh, even though these are extraordinary times and we're dealing with, with a lot uh, and we don't quite know where the end of this, the pandemic is when it will resolve, it, even though that all of that is going on, um, there are some phenomenal things going on in the college, in all of our mission areas uh, that i um, really proud of and just amazed that um, all of our employees have been able to keep moving things forward so productively um, and so creatively over the last few months. It's just a, a pleasure to continue to be the Dean here and to be so proud of everything that all our personnel accomplished. So I'm very grateful for that. I oftentimes tell the associate deans that I love good news on a Friday and it's today is a Wednesday, but um, uh, oftentimes people comply and bring me the, the good news stories about new developments and they're happening all the time. So Nikki, do you think we've uh, 
gotten all the questions that we're likely to have? Yep, I don't have any more. Okay. Well, I'm going to thank you all for um, participating today. And if you think of questions later, uh, send them our way and uh, uh, look forward to interacting with you um, later in the semester, maybe at a Cal's Coffee. Uh, so take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.